Hey, my name is Fernie, and I'm the pastor here at Mid-City Church. I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today here on the online platform. Before we begin, I want to give you a, a couple of uh, instructions as to how to use this platform so that you can have a full worship experience. So to start off, uh, I want to encourage you to look at the top right corner of your screen, and you're going to notice three tabs. One of them is for a connection card. If this is your first time worshiping with us, whatever time you're worshiping at, if this is your first time worshiping with us, I want to encourage you to click on that connection card tab and fill out that card. It's going to ask you for some of your information. It's going to tell you a little bit, little bit about small groups and how you can join them. And it's also going to offer you an opportunity for a prayer request. I really want to encourage you to fill this out, uh, especially if this is your first time. We're going to be sending you a gift in the mail. So you're going to want to fill it out. You're going to want to get that mail later uh, this week, uh, this, that gift in the mail later this week. If this is not your first time, if you worship with us every single week, I want to welcome you. I want to thank you for joining us. If you will let us know that you are here by hitting the heart button on the bottom right of your screen. And I also want to let you know, for any of you, if, if you have a prayer request that you want to share with us, you can click on that uh, prayer request tab, and it'll take you straight to a prayer request form, and you can fill it out, and we'll be praying over that. The last thing I want to, uh, uh, the last tab I want to tell you about is the giving tab. I want to invite you to uh, support the ministry here at Mid City Church, and you can do that in two ways. You can click on that Give tab, or you can text the word Give to 225-307-0662. On both of those platforms, you can set up a one-time gift, you can set up a recurring gift, uh, you can uh, uh, set up a future gift, whatever you want to do, you can do that on either one of those platforms. And I just want to thank you for your gift and your generosity. It's because of uh, your generosity that we're able to do ministry here at Mid-City Church, that we're able to do uh, our small groups, and we were able to do our mission trip last month. We were able to do, we've do. we been able to do so many things and worship, and so I just want to thank you for your generosity. I want to encourage you and ask you to uh, consider uh, giving to Mid-City and the ministry of Mid-City today. Well, again, I'm thankful that you joined us. I hope you have a fantastic worship experience, and get ready because worship begins now.
Tuesday was a tough day for me. For some reason, I really don't know why my anxiety started to rise throughout the day. Uh, yeah, I think I, I was anxious about politics. I was anxious about uh, the hurricane. I was anxious about money. I was anxious about work. I was just anxious. And the higher my anxiety rose, the more I began to create this negative uh, narrative in my head. As the day progressed and my anxiety rose, I began to tell myself that I wasn't good enough. I began to remind myself of uh, my past mistakes, my past regrets. I began to remind myself of every time I had emotionally hurt somebody. Uh, I, I remembered every time I lost my temper. I, I, I began to, to, to create this narrative over myself, this false negative narrative that who I used to be will always define who I am today. Now look, some of you might be thinking, Fernie, that's silly. God loves you, God forgives you, uh, and you know, just accept it. And you're right, you, you are 100% correct about that, but it's not always that easy. Many of you know the exact feeling that I'm talking about, this feeling, this paralyzing feeling when this narrative begins to control you. When this uh, false old narrative begins to control you, it begins to tell you that, that, that you will always be defined by your past, that you're not good enough, right? All these things I said about myself earlier, we, we begin to create this narrative in ourselves, and it's so hard when, when those narratives strike, when those narratives begin to speak so loud in our lives, it is so hard to shake them away. Look, for some of you, your narrative is a struggle with addiction. Maybe your narrative is a struggle with anxiety and depression. Maybe your narrative tells you that you will never be good enough. Maybe your, your narrative tells you that you are failing at everything. Whatever your narrative is, I know and understand. I can relate with you of how these negative narratives can cause can cause us to experience so much pain and anxiety and fear and a whole other set of emotions. The narratives we begin to create about ourselves. A lot of times we make them up. A lot of times people begin to tell us so many negative things that they begin to form a narrative. These narratives can be so destructive in our lives. Whatever that narrative is, I want you to know that life is not supposed to be lived with that narrative hovering over you. Whatever that narrative is, I want you to know that it's not your permanent narrative, that it can change and it can be transformed, which is why I think it is so important for us as a church, for us as Christians, to help people change their narratives. Because when narratives are transformed, that is an example of heaven coming about here and now. When narratives go from negative to positive, we are bringing about heaven here and now in the lives of so many people, and it is our job. It is our job as a church to help shift that narrative. See, I have heard a lot of people tell me that the reason they avoid going to church or getting involved in church stuff is because every time they do, they feel judged and condemned by the church. That every time they do, they feel like they have to hide who they are. Because if the, if, if the church group uh, found out about their past, about who they used to be, what they used to do, that if the church found out, uh, that they begin to judge them. And so, so they stay away from these groups. But that's not the way it's supposed to be as a church, as Christians. It is our job to help change the narrative. It is our job to bring about heaven here and now in the lives of people by offering a different narrative in the lives of so many. Hear me say this. And I, I want you to hear me say this clearly. It is our job as the church and as Christians to bring about heaven here and now. And one of the easiest ways to do that is by changing the narrative 
that people have about themselves. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, we hear this story of this woman caught in adultery. I want you to listen to this. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, uh, the, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They said this to him to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against Jesus. But Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to, th to throw a stone at her. Once again, he bent down and he wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone. He was left alone with this woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. I want you to listen to what's happening in this text. The Pharisees, the scribes, the church leaders, I'm going to call them the church. The church finds this woman in the act of adultery. It's not some rumor. It's not something that they're making up. They literally catch her in the act of adultery. They grab her and they take her to Jesus. And they say to Jesus, they say, in the law, in the Bible, Moses says that we need to stone women like this. What do you say, Jesus? I've got to tell you, every time I read that, I get a little annoyed with these Pharisees, with these church people, because here they are, they bring this woman to Jesus, and they begin to judge her. They begin to condemn her. They begin to ridicule her. They, they begin uh, to hold these stones in their hands, ready to stone her, to throw these stones at her until she dies. They begin to create a narrative in her head, a narrative that says that she's not good enough, that she has messed up too much, that she has committed something that is unforgivable. The church, the church leaders create this negative narrative in her mind. Can you imagine what that must have been like? I'm sure some of you can. I mean, can you imagine this narrative she's creating in her head? The embarrassment she must have felt, the regret, the, the fear, the anxiety. Can you imagine the narrative she began to place over her life because of what she had just done? Now, look, let me stop here for a second because I, I need you to hear me say this. If the church or church people have ever emotionally or physically harmed you, have ever judged you, have ever condemned you, if the church or church people have ever ridiculed you for your sins, if the church or church people have told you that you are too broken or too sinful for God to want to have a relationship with you, I've got to tell you two things. They're wrong, and I'm sorry you ever heard that. They are wrong. And I'm sorry they ever told you that. I can only imagine what the church or church people have put you through if you have ever had to live with this narrative. If you have ever been told by the church that you're not good enough, that you have messed up too much, that, that you will never live up to God's standards, if you have ever been told that, I can't even begin to imagine what you've been through, but know that they were wrong. And I'm sorry. See, the religious people in this text, these church leaders, the, the church, 
they bring this woman to Jesus and they tell him everything that she has done. They, they literally tell Jesus, we found her in the act of adultery just now. And they're hoping that Jesus will condemn her just as they condemn her. But he doesn't. Did you catch what Jesus does? Jesus begins to write in the sand. And then he, he tells them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And he gets back down on the ground and begins to write in the sand. Some of the ancient copies of this text, some of the ancient scrolls, they, they, uh, they add this to it. When Jesus goes back down on the ground, he wrote on the ground the sins of each of them. One by one, the church that was once there to judge her begins to walk away. These church leaders, these religious people, the, the church that was there condemning her and judging her is now walking away because Jesus has reminded them that all of them have a narrative that they're trying to walk away from, that all of them have a past, that all of, what, all of them have sins and regrets and made poor choices in their life. He reminds them that everybody has a narrative that they're trying to walk away from. And Jesus says to them, if you think you don't, throw the stone. But Jesus knew better. See, look, let's be honest. I don't care how churchy people are. I don't care if people have grown up in the church their whole lives. Nobody is perfect. Nobody doesn't have a narrative, a narrative that's negative, a narrative that's bad. All of us carry regrets from our past, mistakes that we wish we hadn't done, decisions that we wonder why we even made in the first place. All of us have a narrative we're trying to walk away from to put behind us. I want you to hear me say this. As a church, we are called to help change those narratives in people's lives. And since none of us are sinless, since all of us have a negative narrative we're trying to leave behind, that means that all of us are called to change not only our narrative, but the narrative of everybody around us. We need to help transform all these negative narratives that people carry, including our own, into a positive narrative. We need to change our narratives from narratives of judgment and condemnation to narratives of grace and forgiveness. And the only way to do that is by leading people to Jesus is by helping people encounter Jesus just as the woman encountered Jesus, not a condemning Jesus, a Jesus that looks at her and says, you're forgiven, you're loved, you're reconciled. It's okay, your past doesn't define you. If we are to bring about heaven here and now, then we have to help change any negative narrative that anybody may have. That is what we're called to do as a church, to lead people to this positive narrative of grace and forgiveness, not to condemn them. Now, the second thing I want you to hear me say, if the church or church people or religious organizations have ever been quick to judge you, to throw your past in your face, to condemn you for decisions you've made, if church or church, church people have ever pretended to speak on behalf of Jesus, I hope you will know that they are wrong. The crowd in our text will never speak on behalf of Jesus. The crowd will never get to speak on behalf of Jesus, no matter what they said, what they did, no matter how they treated this woman. They don't influence what Jesus has to say. And I pray that the same may be true in your life. 
If you have a negative narrative in your life right now that you're trying to let go of, that you're trying to leave behind you, stop listening to the crowds around you telling you that you're not good enough. Instead, begin to listen to Jesus. Because I promise you, he's offering you grace, forgiveness, reconciliation, and he's telling you you are more than good enough. I want you to hear me say this. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are reconciled. Period. No questions asked. Friends, I don't know about you, but I don't want anyone to live with this negative narrative hovering over them. What I felt on Tuesday and those emotions that rose up in me and that narrative I began to tell myself, I did not like living in that on Tuesday, and I don't want anybody to ever have to go through that. And if we truly agree that people shouldn't live that way, then I pray that we may embrace our call to help change people's narratives to invite people into a life with Jesus, a life that offers grace and forgiveness. I pray that we may stop uh, judging the world. I pray that we may stop condemning the world because that's not our job. I pray that instead we may begin to offer the world grace and forgiveness. I pray that as a church we may help erase these false narratives. I pray that as a church we may bring about heaven here and now by changing these narratives and helping people find grace and forgiveness in Jesus. May it be so. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I give you thanks. I give you thanks that the crowds will never influence the way you view me or any of us. I give you thanks that no matter what the crowds, no matter what the church, no matter what anybody may say or think about me, I give you thanks that, that, that they will never have any influence over how you view me or see me. So God, I pray that for me, for any of us, for all of us who have this negative narrative hovering over us, constantly telling us that we're not good enough, that, that we'll never measure up, but whatever that negative narrative in our lives may be, God, I pray that we may find forgiveness and grace in you. I pray that we may find that that when we come into relationship with you, that the crowd begins to walk away, that that narrative begins to walk away because that narrative holds no power over us. Jesus, the moment this woman arrives in your presence, the narrative goes away. And I pray that the same may be true in our lives whatever we're going through, whatever narrative we have carried, remind us that you are offering us grace and forgiveness. God, I pray that we may embrace that narrative, and I pray that we may help others embrace that narrative. Because we know that doing so will bring about heaven here and now. God, I pray this in your most precious and most glorious name. Amen.
I want to thank you for joining us today. I know that um, you could have been doing a million other things, but you chose to worship with us. I really hope that you can take uh, at least one of these two things with you today. I I pray that if you uh, can relate to this woman who has carried this negative narrative, narrative over your life, I pray that you can find grace and forgiveness. In the presence of Jesus, you will. So run to Jesus Uh, pray, read your Bible, get involved in a church. In the presence of Jesus, I promise you that that narrative will go away. But my challenge is, if you have been a part of that crowd, I pray that we may uh, stop uh, embracing that role and that instead it may change to a, a role of bringing about grace and forgiveness to the world because that, my friends, is how we will bring about heaven here and now. Remember, I love you, Jesus loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. I'll see you next week.